Well, there's no toilet paper. And there's no bread. And one man has all the chicken. The perplexing thing about all of this is that there's no shortage of toilet paper, and there's no shortage of bread, and there's certainly no shortage of chicken. And yet, to go find these things, they cannot be found. So I've been wondering, who is it that has the toilet paper? Who is it that has the bread? I know this much. It's not the man who has all the chicken. Last Monday, my daughters and I went out to the grocery store. Now, it's not unusual that on Monday we go to the grocery store. That's our usual day for shopping. But what was unusual is we didn't need much. We needed toothpaste. I think we needed bananas some granola bars. And so we went to the store, quickly grabbed those things, and then made our way to the checkout lane. And we looked for the shortest lane. But once there, that's when we saw him. In the lane next to us was a man with one cart. And that cart was overflowing with chicken. All kinds of chicken. At least there was a variety. There were chicken thighs, chicken wings, chicken breast, chicken drumsticks. And I kid you not, there was just a mound in his cart. And I thought to myself, by day 10 of chicken, you know what he must be thinking. Why did I not grab some pork chops? Especially since the pork chops are right next to the chicken. I want you to listen to how great our text is for today. It begins there in Luke chapter 12, verse 22. Now just listen as it begins. And he said to his disciples. Now pause there just for a moment. What or who is a disciple? A disciple is a person who wants to grow in their relationship with Jesus and to help others do the same. And do you know what I love about that definition? Is that that's a definition we have been learning together. So as Jesus begins... Luke chapter 12, verse 22. Luke wants us to point out to us, pay attention to who this is for. It is for his disciples. It is for those who want to grow in their relationship with Jesus and help others do the same. Now keep that in mind as we keep reading. And so Jesus says to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. And notice how this fits for today. What you will eat. Nor about your body, what you will put on. What does Jesus have to say right away to his disciples? To those who want to grow in their relationship with Jesus and help others do the same. The very first words out of his mouth are this. Don't you be anxious. And yes, I thought about that, staring at that man with that cart full of chicken. Why are you so anxious about chicken? Listen again to what Jesus is saying. It's to his disciples. Don't you be anxious. Now we need to ask this. Be anxious about what? And Jesus continues, what does he tell us to not be anxious about? Don't you be anxious, pay attention to it, don't you be anxious about your life. Mark that down, that's our big idea. 
And it's the big idea for every disciple, for every person who wants to grow in their relationship with Jesus and help others do the same. Don't you be anxious about your life. Okay, now mark this down. This is only the beginning. This time in our country, right now, this is only the beginning. Schools are shut down. Some businesses are shutting down. Our economy right now is taking a huge hit. There's no sports. It very well may be that we will soon not be able to leave our homes. And this is only the beginning. And what I mean by that, we've just completed week one of all this. It's just the beginning, but it sure feels a whole lot longer than just the beginning. And so as we are in this beginning, I ask you this. What does our community need from us? Disciples, don't you be anxious about your life. What is one of the greatest things we could do for our community right now? Disciples, those of you that want to grow in your relationship with Jesus and help others do the same. Since we are at the beginning, and this will continue, don't you be anxious about your life. I have to tell you, I got kind of excited about this text. We have been studying the Gospel of Luke since December of 2018. And since December of 2018, in our study of Luke, and we started with Luke chapter 1, there have been times that we've taken pauses for different reasons, like Resurrection Sunday. And my point to you is this. We never, ever planned to be in Luke 12, 22 through 34, on March 22nd, 2000, 2020. And think about how perfect it is. At such a time as this, we are hearing from the lips of Jesus to his disciples, don't you be anxious about your life. And it made me ask this question. Does our God know what we need? Better yet, does our God know what we need when we need it? And you go further with it than that. Does our God know what we need when we need it, before we know we need it? And the answer is a resounding yes. So I wondered, and I wondered in amazement, how great is it that in December 1st, 2018, God knew that almost two years later, we would need to be hearing Luke 12. And so what do we need to hear today? Disciples, on this particular day, at the beginning of all this, at this moment in everyone's lives, don't you be anxious, don't miss it, about what? Your life. Now I have to point this out because I think it's kind of important. That word anxious, it means to be pulled apart in another direction. I thought that's kind of interesting as we begin to, to think about anxiety that way. You know, as we began, I thought, too, does being anxious need any explanation? Because I think we all know what it means. And worse, worse than that, I think we all know how it feels. And here's Jesus saying, don't you be anxious. But hold on to that literal definition. It, the Greek word there literally means to be pulled apart in another direction. Now let's just keep asking questions. Why does Jesus tell his disciples to not be anxious? Now Luke 12 is not the only place in the Bible where we hear a command like this. Don't you be anxious. I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 4. Just to give an example that the Bible has a lot to say to disciples about being anxious. Philippians 4 
starting with verse 5. Actually, we'll start with verse 4. Listen to what's written here to those who want to grow in their relationship with Jesus and help others do the same. Philippians 4, starting verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Now let's pause for a second. How can I do that? How can I, as Jesus' disciple, let my reasonableness be made known to everyone? Well, we keep reading. The Lord is at hand. Watch. Do not be anxious about anything. So how might I be able to show my reasonableness to everyone? Don't you be anxious. About what? Well, here it says anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you know when it's time to get anxious? When it's time to get anxious. When there's an anxious time, that's when you need to hear, don't you be anxious. And I think we would all agree we're living in a time, wow, this is causing me to be anxious. So what do we need to hear, especially now at the beginning? Don't you be anxious. And think about how great a time it is. This is my moment to show my reasonableness to everyone. Now, what does the writer of Philippians, who's Paul, what does he tell us to do when we're feeling anxious? At times when it's, it, now is the time to be anxious. What should we do? Well, in everything, by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And when I do that, what am I assured of? And the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's a peace that the Bible says surpasses all understanding. Now think about this. What does the peace of God guard my heart and mind from? It guards it from anxiety, feeling anxious, especially when it's time to get anxious. And it continues there in verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So when it's time to get anxious, what should I do? Well, respond in prayer with much rejoicing, with supplications, with thanksgiving. What else can I do? Well, there's things to think about. Think on these things. Think about what is honorable. Think about what is just. Think about what's pure. Think about what is lovely, what is commendable. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And what's the guarantee? Well, do this too. What you have learned and received and heard and seen, seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Just another example of how the Bible speaks to being anxious, especially when it's time to get anxious. 1 Peter 5, and we'll start with verse 6. 1 Peter 5, starting with verse 6, reads, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Doing what? Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now, what should I do when I'm feeling anxious? Tell God about it. Give it to him. Talk to him all about it. And what's the reason? Verse 8, be sober-minded, be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So it's just interesting as you look at Philippians. What should I do when I'm feeling anxious? Well, with prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, make it known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus from what? Feeling anxious. 
Then there's things to think about. Put all these things into practice. Then you go to 1 Peter, and what's Peter say about being anxious? Tell God about it. Give it to him. For what reason? Well, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, let's think on this. When does he pounce? When is it most likely that that roaring lion will pounce? Could it be when it's time to get anxious? Could it be that when you're feeling anxious is when you're most vulnerable to the evil one pouncing, looking for someone to devour? Go back to Luke 12. And again, just keep focusing on what Jesus is saying to his disciples. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. And we're asking this big question. Why is Jesus telling his disciples, don't you be anxious? Don't you be anxious about your life? Let's keep reading. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Here comes the reason. For life is more than food. Life is more than clothing. In other words, life is more than stuff. Life is more than toilet paper. Life is more than bread. Life is more than chicken. Therefore, don't get anxious about the toilet paper. Therefore, do not get anxious about the bread. Therefore, do not get anxious about the chicken. Life is more than these things. is more than these things. And again, who is Jesus speaking to? He's talking to his disciples. Those who want to grow in their relationship with Jesus and help others do the same. Think about what Jesus now is saying to his disciples. Disciples, life is more than stuff. So I want to ask this question. And it's only because Jesus is trying to get his disciples to think. If life is more than stuff, what then is life? For the disciple, what then is life? If Jesus is telling his disciples, don't you get pulled apart in another direction. And when am I most likely to get anxious? When it's time to get anxious. That's when I need to most hear, don't you get anxious. Why? Because life is more than stuff. Well, therefore, I need to be asking this. Well, for me... As a disciple of Jesus, what then is life? Look at that word, therefore, in verse 22. A good question to always ask whenever you're studying the Bible and you come across a therefore is this. What is it there for? That word, therefore, plays a very important role because it makes us think about what Jesus had just said previously. Remember, we're in a chapter where the largest crowd ever has gathered to hear Jesus say something. And when he begins to say something, his lips are moving, but they don't hear anything coming out. And it's because he took this opportunity, as the largest group ever has gathered, to say something to his disciples. And he has been saying something to his disciples for 12 verses. And finally, there's one man who can't take it anymore, and he interrupts. And when he interrupts, he wants Jesus to settle a family dispute. What's Jesus' response to him? Well, Jesus tells a story. In the Bible, those things are called parables, and it's a story that helps illustrate a larger truth. And in that story, there's a rich man who gets richer. And that rich man, since he gets richer, he thinks to himself, I have no more worries for the rest of my life. I have no reason ever, no matter what, to ever get anxious about anything. Listen to what Jesus says at the end of that story. It's verse 21. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Well, why did Jesus say that? It's because as he introduced the story, as he introduced the parable, he had this to say first, and it's in verse 15. And he says to the whole crowd, including the disciples sitting there, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Now listen. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. In other words, life 
is not measured by all your stuff. Think about what Jesus just said to the disciples as he continues. Therefore, I tell you, don't you get anxious about your life. Why? Because life is more than stuff. It's the introduction right to the parable. As it begins, Jesus wants everyone to hear this. Life is not measured by what you have or by what you don't have. But we know this much, and the answer's in the parable. Life is measured. How is life measured? It was in that verse 21 that we read just a little bit ago. How is life measured? It's with this question. Am I rich toward God? And last week we saw this. Well, how might I be rich toward God? How, how can I live that out? And we asked several questions. And the list is not exhaustive. These are just ideas to help us think. What's it mean to be rich toward God? How do I live that out? One question I thought of was this. What value do I place on the local church? How about this? What value do I place in growing in my relationship with Jesus? What value do I place in helping others do the very same thing? What value do I place on my marriage? What value do I place on being a servant? How about this? What value do I place on human life? So your list is not exhaustive, but there's things to think about. What are, what are the things I value? What value do I place on these things more than I place on stuff? Life is not measured by stuff, how much you have or don't have, but life is measured. And the measurement is this. Are you rich toward God? Having said that in the parable, Jesus turns around to his disciples and says, now that you know that life is measured and you know how life is measured, this is what I have to say to you. Therefore, don't you get anxious about your life. See, it begins with the parable, knowing first, how is life measured? What do I value? How do I value it? And since I know that, when it comes time to get anxious, don't you get anxious about your life. Now again, pay attention to the word anxious. I told you it's the big idea of this whole text. Saying to every disciple, don't you get anxious about your life. That word anxious gets used three times in what Jesus has to say next. It starts here in verse 22. That's the first time it gets used. And keep in mind, it literally means this. To get pulled apart in another direction. So when it comes time to get anxious, don't you do it. Here's the first occurrence. We've read it several times. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. And yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Verse 25. And which of you, by being anxious... There's a second occurrence. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? In other words, you disciples, how does being anxious benefit your life? What benefits have you ever seen in your life when it comes to being anxious? And you know what the answer is. None. How does being anxious ever help you? Never. Listen to verse 26. And again, it's of what you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life. How does being anxious benefit your life? Verse 26. If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that. That always makes me laugh when I read it. Because Jesus is saying, it's a small thing to lengthen your life. It's a, it's a small thing to add more time to your life. What does Jesus follow that up with? So tell me, if you cannot even add to the length of your life, why are you anxious about the rest? Why are you anxious about toilet paper? Why are you anxious about bread? Why are you anxious about chicken? And remember, life is not measured by those things. Life is more than those things. And I'm so grateful. Can you imagine measuring life by toilet paper one square at a time? 
Why is not measured by those things? It's being measured by how rich I am toward God. And when it comes time to be anxious, God has this to say to us. Don't do it. Especially to my disciples, don't you do it. You know as my disciples, it doesn't benefit life. You know as my disciples, it doesn't help your life. And the thing is, he knows we're going to have times to get anxious. That's why he's saying this. Why do you get anxious about the rest? Goes with another, another example. Consider the lilies. They're here today, gone tomorrow. God takes care of them. What's Jesus getting at? Look at verse 28. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow sown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Jesus is saying to us, God knows what you need. He knows why you go to the grocery store. He, because he knows you need those things. So when it's come time to get anxious at such a time as this, why do you get so anxious about they're out of toilet paper, they're out of chicken, they're out of... God knows you need them. And since he knows you need them, what is he going to do for you always? He's going to provide you with them. So I thought about this further yesterday. And I did get anxious this week. When I saw the bread aisle for the third time, have no bread, I got a little anxious. Like, what in the world is going on? Where is all the bread? How much longer is this going to last? We don't know. It's indefinite. But look how Jesus follows it up. Oh, you of little faith. When I have those moments, when I get anxious about the things God knows I need, it's like I'm saying to God, I don't believe that you know I need them. It's like I'm saying to God, I don't believe not only that you don't know I need them, you don't know when I need them. And I'm a little worried that you may not give it to me. See what the big point is? Don't get anxious about your life. Life is more than this stuff. And we rest on this. I know God knows I need them. He knows when I need them, and he knows it before I need it. So what am I assured of God's always going to do? He's going to take care of me. If he takes care of the rotten ravens and the rotten crows, how much more value am I to him than a crow? If he takes care of the lilies, which are arrayed in splendor, but they're here today and gone tomorrow. They're here today to look at it so beautiful. Tomorrow they're thrown in the fire. How much more is he going to take care of me? He knows what I need, when I need it, before I know I need it. So therefore, if I know how life is measured, and I'm hearing Jesus say, since you know life, how life is measured, be rich toward God. And when it comes time to get anxious, don't you get anxious. What should I be doing instead? Look at verse 29. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. What do you hear three times in those verses? Should be the word seek. And you notice what Jesus is doing? Three times prior, he told us the word anxious. Don't get anxious about these things that you know you need. Instead, we hear three more times after that the word seek. So don't be anxious about your life. Don't get anxious about the rest. How much does anxiety help you? And Jesus finishes it off with this. Here's how you need to be thinking when it's time to get anxious. Verse 29. Don't seek after these things that you need. Does that mean don't go to the grocery store? No. Verse 30. For all the nations of the world seek after these things. Well, how do the nations of the world seek after these things? They seek after it, not knowing and not believing God's going to supply it. So therefore, don't you seek after these things like the world does. See the difference? For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Look at verse 31. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. So what do I need to do when life gets filled with anxiety? 
Instead, do what? Seek his kingdom. And these things, what things? The things he knows I need will be added unto me. So we can end with this. I am told to seek something. What is it I am to be seeking? Seek his kingdom. It continues on in verse 32. And it's still with this idea. We've started with, don't you be anxious about life. Look where Jesus has led us. When it comes time to get anxious, don't be anxious about your life. Instead, verse 31, seek his kingdom. The things you're worried about, God will supply them for you. Here's what you need to give your mind to. Seek his kingdom. Verse 32, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So what's going hand in hand now? Seek his kingdom and your father. Notice the relationship that's being emphasized here. Who is God? He's my father. Seek his kingdom. Why? Because he's so glad to give it to you. When or why does he give me the kingdom? It's only when I want it. It's only when I seek after it. It's only when I desire it. Seek his kingdom. And he is so glad to hand it to you. He's so glad to give it to you. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Again, think back to that parable. Life is more than stuff. So how should I be handling my stuff? Well, think about this way. How can I use my stuff for the sake of others? Sell your possessions and give to the needy. How can I be using all my stuff for the good of other people? Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. In other words, when you live like this, you'll never fail. If I keep looking at all my stuff as a means to help other people, I'm guaranteed this. I'll never fail in doing so. And then what's the big end of this? In doing all this, I get to reveal where my treasure is. I get to reveal where my heart lies. What do I really treasure? Who do I really treasure? When does that all get revealed? Seeking his kingdom. And how I view my possessions. And how I use it for the good of others. Now I hope you're wondering this. What in the world does it mean to seek his kingdom? How do I do it? I thought about three things. When it comes to seeking his kingdom, I thought about this. This kingdom he's talking about is where Jesus is king. We know that for sure from Colossians 1, 13 through 14. That when it comes to being his disciple, what has happened to me? God has taken me out of the domain of darkness and has placed me into the kingdom of his beloved son. So when he says seek his kingdom, we're talking about a kingdom where Jesus is king. What else can we know about this kingdom? Well, it's the kingdom where Jesus is king. And in a kingdom, you have people. What kind of people? In this kingdom, there are people there who love the king. So in this kingdom, Jesus is king. In this kingdom, there are people who love the king. And lastly, in this kingdom... There's a different kind of living. So I have to keep that in mind when I think about seeking his kingdom. There's a king there. His name is Jesus. There are people there. It's people that love the king. And in that kingdom, there's a different kind of living. So again, how might I be seeking his kingdom? Especially at times when I'm really feeling anxious. Especially at a time like this. When it's time to get anxious, what do I need to keep in mind? Seek his kingdom. How do I do it? I know this much. I cannot do it without my Bible. Because it's with my Bible. And choosing moments to hear the word of God, that's how I know and grow in my love for the king. Keep thinking. How else might I seek his kingdom? Can't do it without my Bible? And I know this much, I can't do it without others who are doing the very same thing. Remember, there's people in this kingdom who love the king. How do you grow in your love for the king? Not without the word of God choosing moments to hear it. So I need to be with those same people who are choosing to have moments to hear the word of God, to grow in their love for the king. And lastly, I can't do it. 
without taking the things I hear in the word of God and applying it to my own life. That's the different kind of living. When Jesus speaks, when he speaks to his disciples here, what's the expectation? I want you now to go apply it to your life. That's kingdom living. Kingdom living is not getting anxious about my life. When? When it's time to get anxious. That's kingdom living. Kingdom living is, seeking his kingdom is, seeking those moments to hear the word of God for this reason. I want to grow in my love for the king. And I want to do it with others who are doing the very same thing. And therefore, all of us together in this kingdom are applying these things to our lives. But then I wonder this. How do I do it stuck in my house? Because that's virtually where we're all at. Especially here at the beginning. And who knows how much longer it's going to last. We're stuck in our homes. So how do I do that? How do I seek his kingdom while I'm stuck in my house? It begins here. Praise God for technology. Because I cannot imagine doing this 100 years ago. Here we are in 2020. And again, marvel at the fact that God has us in Luke 12 on this particular day. When it's time to get anxious, we hear him say, don't you get anxious about your life. This is exactly what your community needs for such a time as this, is the disciples of Jesus, those who want to grow in their relationship with him and help others do the same. This is exactly what they need. They need disciples who are not getting anxious about their own lives. Instead, they're watching a people seek his kingdom. Well, still, how do I do that in my own home, stuck in my own home? Again, be very grateful for technology. This whole video streaming is a means to choose a moment to hear the word of God. But even without it, what do you still have in your home? You have the word of God. Read it and listen to it. And again, praise God for technology because there's a wonderful thing called a cell phone. And I would encourage you throughout this week as you're stuck in your home, Start calling other disciples and encourage them in such a time as this to be running to the word of God, to hear moment, have moments to hear what he has to say. And why is that? Because this is a time to get anxious and to hear Jesus say, don't you do it. Pray to him. Pray incessantly to him. Tell him exactly what's on your heart and mind. Intercede for others. And we just saw in Philippians 4, we're guaranteed this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Then start thinking about things that he's told you to think about. Practice these things. And how about this great assurance, the God of peace will be with you. What's well, another reason to do this? 1 Peter 5, I know this much, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone who he may devour. Who might that person be? A person who's growing anxious at a time when it's filled with anxiety, not giving it to God. And in all that, it leads us to this, to be seeking his kingdom, even while we're stuck in our homes, having precious moments to hear the word of God. In turn, reach out to people who are doing the very same thing, people who are wanting to grow in their love for the king and doing so by hearing the word of God. And even in your home, you have an opportunity to be practicing these things, applying it to your life. So I hope you marvel at all that today where God has us. I know it's different. I know it's kind of strange. But we're living in this time because God has placed us here for such a time as this. Oh, great God, I hope and pray that that was some sort of encouragement to all who have ears to hear. In Jesus' name.
Oh, may this morning be a big help for the week ahead. For we don't know what lies ahead, but God does. It's just like in the Old Testament, he has gone before us and he will lead us all the way. Oh, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Every day when we wake up this week, probably to new news, may your name be revered. As we trust you, as we look to you, as we remember who you are, for we are calling upon your name in such a time as this, as the Lord who will provide, as the Lord who does protect, as the Lord who is our rock and our redeemer. There is your name, and you are good and gracious. You are full of mercy and kindness, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. That is who you are. So may your name resound throughout this week. I thank you that we know you and are growing in our knowledge of who you are. As we grow in who you are and as we seek your face, I humbly ask that you will bless us with knowing more of you, knowing you better. And in so doing, that your peace, which surpasses all understanding, will abound in our lives. And may I ask this of you, that no matter what happens, what we hear, or where we have to stay, may our great countenances reflect who you are, our joy in you. In Jesus' name, amen.